Hello everybody and welcome to the third episode of our podcast interview series hosted by the Centre for Manuscript and Text Cultures at the Queen's College, University of Oxford. My name is Gabriele Rotter, I'm a research fellow in classics at Queen's and today I'm very happy to be interviewing our own college librarian, Dr. Matthew Shaw. Good afternoon, Matt, and thank you very much for joining us. How are you doing today? I'm good, thanks, and, and thanks for asking me to join. <laughs> Not at all, we're so lucky to have you. All right, Matt, if you don't mind, I will take a few seconds to explain some practicalities to our listeners before we start. The interview will be divided into three consecutive sections, which will be duly signposted as we go along. A first more general section about who you are, you know, and what you're doing at Queen's, will be followed by two more specific sections about aspects of your research and work as a curator. Fantastic. We may now start with the first section then, and I would like to start by talking about beginnings. So, Matt, you studied for a DPhil in history at the University of York when you wrote a dissertation on the history of the French Republican calendar. So, could you tell us more about your first steps as a researcher and how that led you to a career in libraries? I'm particularly interested in why you chose a career in libraries in the first instance rather than a more traditional, as it were, academic path after a doctorate in history. Some of our listeners might be now in the situation in which you were back then and could draw some real inspiration from your story. Anyway, that was just a very long preamble on my part. I hope that what I was asking is clear enough. And if so, go ahead. Yeah, I guess like many people, when I was doing my PhD, I wasn't entirely sure what I was going to do. I thought I would be a great world lecturer, but I always knew I enjoyed researching in libraries and archives and uh, the thrill of the quest and hunt in the archives, uh, but also how they worked and how they came into being. And at university, I, I realised I enjoyed doing a variety of different things as well, editing magazines and uh, involved in the GCR and things like that. So I knew I wanted a career that enabled you to do a range of different activities. And as things progressed, it clear that library Ownership um, offered that. And like many people, after finishing my PhD, I moved to the big city. I moved to London. And because of the two body problem, I was looking for a job largely in London, although I had some interviews around the place elsewhere. And I, I saw the job in the British Library in the Department of Manuscripts come up as a curator there. And I thought, wow, that sounds really interesting. Um, so I applied and discovered actually, yes, librarianship and archives and exhibitions was a really interesting career to follow. Marvellous. Thanks very much for your answer. Now, Matt, let's continue with a pair of related questions. I will ask them both at once, if you don't mind. First, how would you describe your interaction with academia over the years? And it was more of a general question. And second, do you feel that a scholar working as a curator or a librarian such as yourself has more or less time to devote to research than, say, a faculty member at the British University? That's a really interesting question and one that, well, the answers to it have changed over, over I suppose, the two decades that I've been working in libraries and um, other institutions. I was fortunate as well in that at the British Library and uh, the Institute of Historical Research, I was able to do teaching at Birkbeck and at the IHR. So there was some um, parts of the academic life that I was able to pursue, which were interesting and, and informed as well the, the librarianship and the curatorship as well. But over the years, I think things have changed and it's really become more systematised in probably a good way in the sense that large institutions can be independent research organisations and there is a value to be placed on research, which perhaps took place in places like the British Museum and the British Library on a sort of unofficial or an ad hoc basis. And there was always a battle between core work and academic work and uh, time given to these various activities can be difficult to juggle. But uh, over the years, I noticed it became more systematised. One could apply for a search break, uh, and there could be research projects, um, whilst at the same time recognising that librarians and academics have slightly different specialisms, and maybe the things one focused on were less uh, long-term research projects and more about uncovering processes of digitisation or helping to get particular areas catalogued and better understood and connecting teams of researchers rather than doing the research oneself. In terms of time, it's hard to say. I mean, everybody's incredibly busy. The advantage of working in a library is you can claim your nine to five, although, of course, you often have to do Saturday shifts and things like that. Um, if you want to just put it on one side, you don't always have to be doing things. On the other hand, there can also be lots of evening works and so on as well. All right. In the second section of our interview, we'll be discussing in detail the almost 20 years that you spent working in London. But now, Matt, let's fast forward to your current position at Queen's. Here's what I would like to ask you. Would you say that your role at Queen's is very different from your previous jobs at the British Library at the Institute of Historical Research? And if so, how exactly? 
I mean, there are obvious differences, and I think it's really where your sort of responsibilities lie. At the BL um, and some percent the IHR is a national role or responsibilities, and you're a public servant, and that that's who your responsibilities lie towards, as well as the collections, which, which of course belong to the public. Whereas the college, really, you're here to serve college and its the community, uh, but also the objects of the college. And um, Queen's are particularly interesting, like the other colleges, we're a charitable institution, and we are there to help scholarship and education, very broadly defined. So in some ways, actually, there are some similarities, but you do have that community. You have the junior members of college who are here for three or four years. You have the postgraduate community, you have the fellows who've been here for considerably longer than that, and the old members as well. And it's nice to have that focus, whereas in the British Library or the IHR, you may just see one person who comes in to find one particular thing and you never see them again. You don't have that same sense of a research community and a scholarly community in quite the same way as you do here. Lots of similarities and differences then. All right. We have said that at Queen's you are the college librarian. So Matt, could you please comment in a few words on how the role of librarian has changed in the past centuries and the past decades? For example, you know, in terms of background, in terms of qualifications, duties, and of course, public engagement. Talking about the transition from the so-called ivory tower to a myriad of different outreach activities. I'm enjoying learning more about how the library was managed and developed over the years. And in particular, it's interesting how Queen's College Library has led the way in many ways. In the 18th century or the late 17th century, when it was the new library, in the 19th century, again, the librarian was very forward thinking and introduced new cataloguing methods and also had it that we had a library for undergraduates, which was quite a novel thing in those days. In the 20th century, again, it's uh, changed over time and it was questions about space and my predecessors um, helped develop a very bold modern library for undergraduates in the main to use as well. And I suppose there's a parallel strand of, of librarianship as it's become more professionalised over the years. And people now you know, will have be qualified librarians, there will be standards and so on. We work in partnership much more perhaps than we did in the past with colleagues around Oxford in terms of sharing a, an automated catalogue. So there's been a development in terms of technical specialisms, I suppose, a general progress to making the collections more open, firstly to undergraduates and then to other researchers. Um, and then an expansion of things libraries do, not just a place where and studies and read books, it's a place where people feel attached to and spend a lot of time. It's a place for events, it's a place for exhibitions, a place that also supports well-being amongst the college as well. So it really feeds into all aspects of college life, or one hopes it does anyway. Well, certainly it does. Splendid. And now, from the librarian to the library. One of the primary functions of a college library is to be available to students, as you were saying. This, in normal circumstances, would be ordinary business. But when you joined Queen's in September 2020, the library was about to reopen after being closed for six long months. So, how was it to start, so to speak, in the middle of things? And how have you and your team reacted to the coronavirus pandemic in the last few months? Could you give us, you know, examples of the difficulties that you have encountered on the way? I mean, I guess like everybody, it's been a really challenging time. And it was an unusual time to start a new role without people sort of met one's colleagues, pop them on a screen. But in some ways, it provided for more chances to meet people before starting a job through Zoom to get a sense of what needs to be done. And I started talking with my colleagues here at Queen's in the library, all of whom have done extraordinary work getting things together. If we were thinking on the same lines about how we might be able to offer a service, what needed to be done. And I suppose I can come from thinking about how to open up the library in London along with colleagues there contributing to the group opening up St House Library there and also the IHR working with people to think about how that could be made safe and I suppose what's been really interesting in this process is nobody has been doing it alone and for librarians it's pleasing to see clearly how important libraries are to universities and the public in general and it was great to work with colleagues across the sector in the public library sector the academic sector and elsewhere there were an awful lot of sharing of information internationally as well as nationally we had all sorts of questions how long should we quarantine things or what do we do about ventilation should we be open at all all those questions were thrashed out in a very open and helpful way. And so when it came to Open Queens, we had a certain amount of confidence that we weren't doing this blindly. We were comparing ourselves against other institutions and had a rationale for what we were doing, how we were measuring risk, how we were seeing what we could offer. The positive implications of your answer are much needed in this period of great uncertainty. And I quite like the idea that collaboration may allow us to overcome even a world pandemic, at least in the context of a library, you know. 
All right, on to the next question now. There are two basic categories of users of research libraries. We talked about students, so let's talk about scholars now. Scholars come to the library for archives, manuscripts and rare books. So Matt, how often and in what ways do you deal with these kind of items and requests at Queen's? And I suppose it actually is the thing which has uh, changed because of the pandemic. The, the numbers of people traveling around and expecting to have access to special collections has, has reduced. But we have had a couple of requests a week at the moment. I think before I arrived in normal times, we'd probably have one or two visits a day, something like that, particularly during busy times. And we're, of course, always thinking about ways that we can ensure that people know about the collections and make use of them. But again, not to be sort of too Pollyanna-ish about it, in some ways, it's been good to think about alternative ways of providing access to the collections, using things like mobile phones to take quick images to even do live zoom consultations with manuscript we've been able to do that and uh, which is great for researchers it's also useful for us it's useful for me because i get to learn about the collection quicker than i would have done otherwise perhaps and we've already been able to update our catalog having been able to date an arabic manuscript which somebody in america was able to consult over my mobile phone but it changes from month to month and it is a frustration the frustration that everybody feels that people can't just pop in and spend time with materials and have that serendipitous discovery rather than having to think carefully about. Well, if I may interject, I have a follow-up question with some personal implications, and by personal, I mean personal on my part, of course. So, my doctoral research was on early Renaissance manuscripts of the Latin classics. This involved travelling to libraries all around Europe to see these manuscripts. The many encounters that I made back then have reinforced in my mind the stereotype of the librarian as some sort of inflexible and sometimes even narrow-minded keeper of the books. Now, Matt, you don't remind me of that stereotype at all, and that's precisely why I'm asking you this question. So, as a librarian, how do you mediate between the institutional duty of protecting rare items and the ethical duty, so to speak, of making these very items available to as many people as possible. You have coordinated digitization projects, so I presume that you think that digitization is at least part of the solution, but what about, for example, allowing users to photograph the items for private study with their phones or with a camera? Should that be allowed? Yes? No? Or only under very specific circumstances? Yeah, the really interesting question and touches on a range of discussions and debates that I think librarians and archivists have had over the years. And I think, yeah, on the one hand, there is a stereotype, but there's a certain tradition amongst librarianship of being overly strict because that's how you protect the materials and you ensure good order in the reading room and people don't disturb other people and so on. But I think the count that there's a strong tradition for every book that their reader, as librarians say, desire to put people in touch with, with what they need and to get the books out there. And if they're not consulted, then it's almost as if you don't have them. There is the responsibility to the future generation of readers. You don't want the things to fall apart. But hopefully that's where training and handling materials and good conservation practices and suitable facsimiles where they're available come into place and yeah most librarians and then think back to my career at the British Library you're very much there in service of the public you're there to help and underpin research and study you're there to encourage it and that's what the collections are for as well as being a national print archive or an archive of manuscripts and items that are often treasures themselves but they're there ultimately to serve a purpose Questions about digitization are really interesting and the ones that have been discussed a lot as well. There's the sense that digitizing things stops people consulting the originals. Where in fact, I think it's largely considered that by digitizing things, it makes people aware of items and then there will be a reason for consulting the original for maybe looking for evidence of use or within the paper or the binding or something which isn't in the digital facsimile. And growing up somewhere a long way away from many libraries in the middle of the West Country, I'm aware of how useful it is to be able to access stuff remotely. And we've been reminded of that recently. Certainly, it makes a lot of sense for people to take photographs of stuff. It's a shame there aren't platforms out there for people to then share them, although there's been discussions about that over the years. And it's been interesting to work on various projects at the BL and elsewhere on user-generated content. The Europeana project brought people out to events where they were bringing things from the First World War and their family that that could be digitised in a very speedy way using quite um, consumer-level equipment, scanners and cameras with some experts on hand to advise people about the materials and then also um, enable them to upload their own own images to a centralised website to do with the First World War and to give them the metadata and uh, information to do that properly. 
But within libraries themselves, there are also questions about conservation. So again, it's about helping to people to understand how they can scan things usefully and sensibly in a reading room. But also there are questions about copyrights, questions about data protection as well, and so on, which have to be considered and users perhaps aren't always aware of that. And the problem, of course, is you would then end up perhaps with thousands and thousands of photographs of things that you don't have time to go back and look at properly. But that's another issue. Fantastic, Matt. And now we've made it to the second section of our interview in which we'll be talking about your work in London. And we're going to do that after a short break. And we're back. All right, Matt, first question first. At the British Library, you worked mainly in the Americas collection, of which you were lead curator for several years. So is that an interest that you took up after you started working at the BL? Or was your interest in that specific collection the reason why you joined the British Library in the first instance? Not entirely. No, I started off in the Department of Manuscripts in the 18th and 19th century historical and political papers section. Well, section was, was me, I think. So that was more British, but I had just completed at that time my PhD on the French revolutionary calendar. And out of that, I was interested in something I did on my, for my MA on the revolution in Saint-Domingue and uh, Haiti, what became Haiti, and also on French emigres to London, but also in particular to America. So I suppose it was the Atlantic world, which was um, a hot topic then and still is to some extent, but I was curious about that. And on the back of that, I started to study some French emigres to Philadelphia, and I was also interested in timekeeping methods and ephemeral printing, which led me to be interested in almanacs, which led to an interest in American almanacs. And I was also intrigued, not just by the manuscripts I was working with, but by the rare books. So I was keen to work in the printed collections as well as the manuscript collections. So I jumped over to the America section, which I knew a bit about from my undergraduate masters and was learning more about through my research, but then became a learning experience over 15 years in the America section. Yeah, which is an interesting thing to sort of take up a field. You end up, I suppose, covering an awful lot of ground and becoming a generalist or starting off as a generalist and being aware that you're not going to know the answer means that you learn how to find out the answer quite quickly and maybe get a sense of the field and who knows these things and who might want to be put in touch with other people and whatever institutions are working in these areas. So it was um, a process of learning on the job to some extent. Fair enough. Well, actually, I can relate quite strongly to what you just said as I recently started working on something completely different from my doctoral work and the effect has been both very exciting but also, I have to say, terrifying. It's like, you know, when you realize you don't know so many things, you have to turn to the experts in order to, in order to figure it out. And I have to say that most of the time the advice has come promptly and generously, which is wonderful. There were cases, even, which is depressing, you know, people from college who didn't even reply to my messages, but that was just a minority of cases and normally people are very eager to share their knowledge and to help you out when you're in doubt. Anyway, what I wanted to ask you is this. In the mid-2000s, you curated an exhibition on the American founding father Benjamin Franklin, a British exhibition about an American legend, we could say. So, do you think that the British Library, Matt, was the ideal place for such an exhibition? And if so, why? Yeah, I think it was. I mean, it was tercentenary and there was going to be a big one in, in Philadelphia and it was talk of it travelling around as well. But of course, Franklin was born an Englishman or part of the English the British Empire. Um, he spent a lot of his life living in London, not very far from the British Library on Craven Street or close to the British Museum, I suppose. And he was deeply connected with British life and his son was buried in St. Patrick's Churchyard just at the back of the library. So there were all sorts of resonances and the BL had uh, very strong holdings of print, but also Manchester material. So that and the anniversary, plus the library at that point was interested in emphasising how it could support businesses as well. And so the idea of seeing Franklin as an innovator, as an inventor, I think helped get the process of getting the exhibition approved over the line, but also could sort of link into the more modern and contemporary events the library was doing at the time. Fantastic. But let me ask you a practical question now. So you said that you had a vast collection of items from which to choose for this exhibition on Franklin. So here's what I would like to know. How do you start making a selection of material in such cases? And especially, how do you make final choices after most of the unsuitable or less suitable material has already been discarded, removed? You know, I'm talking about the moment when you're left with the items that you really would like to have on display, 
but on the other hand you're aware that you will not be able to include them all. So what do you do then? Oh yeah, well, this was a front hall exhibition and it was, at that point that space hadn't really been used for many exhibitions so it was working out how to use that area. And I suppose I kind of realised that I worked backwards from the experience of visiting an exhibition. You work back from what is somebody getting out of seeing this space for? Is it something they're just popping in while having to be in the library or is it something they will make a special visit for? Are they experts? Are they generalists? And really it became clear that most people didn't really know too much about Benjamin Franklin so you needed to explain who and what he did and, and so on. And to make Make it interesting to the occasional visitor whilst also having a bit of depth to those specialists who would come and see certain things. It's also a space where you can't put everything out there because of light levels and so on. So that's another level of complication. So that was one of the starting points. The other one is the individual stories and bits you want to tell. You have to have a beginning, a middle and an end to an exhibition, at least a sort of a, these are topics you want to cover. So we knew we need certain materials to cover that. But on the other hand, people want to come and go and look and enjoy and be in the presence of something. So yes, star items were key. If we didn't have those, then it wouldn't have worked. So some manuscript material that we had from him, some of his earliest printing, some of his fantasy printing, which are you know, very enjoyable volumes to look at. Um, but then also perhaps star items like the New England Currents, which the newspaper he worked on when he was very young in, in Boston. Um, and the copy in the British Library is particularly special because it is annotated. It's full of tales by, or reports by people like Silence Duguid and who is these anonymous contributors to the paper. And Franklin has annotated the newspaper and, and you can work out who these people actually are or who had written, whether his brother had written them or he had written them. Or. So as an item, it's rich textually and because of and manuscripts as well. But yeah, so you end up with maybe one star item per case and then supporting items which tell the story quick in a good way as possible and in practical terms it's really tricky to limit yourself as I've gone on doing exhibitions I've really tried to limit it to as few things as possible in a case and items that speak to one another so the case as a whole makes sense but really it's cutting out things that even though you may find them particularly interesting you realize that they're only going to work on the web or, or something or something else really needs to go in, in the case instead. It's fascinating, isn't it, how the perfectionism that we so often associate with academic writing can be found among curators of exhibitions as well. That was a very instructive story, Matt. Thank you. Okay, on to the next question. A couple of weeks ago, I interviewed Mojeni Voyona, who's professor of Celtic and Medieval Studies at Cambridge. So, among many other things, Mojeni and I talked about the spectacular illumination of some medieval manuscripts copied in Ireland, such as the famous Book of Kells. I know that the notion of spectacular is relative and changes over time, and that is why I'm asking you this question, in a sense. So, Matt, if you were to single out a spectacular item from the Benjamin Franklin exhibition, which one would that be, and why? I'm also interested in the visitors' reaction and their feedback, if you were able to collect it somehow. I think I really like the exhibition of Cato, which was a really fine example of excellent printing. And the book itself is nice to look at. It's clearly well printed. It's a reasonably large size, quite square size. Um, the binding is quality work, even though it's not too covered in gold or anything, but it's very neatly done. But then the more you learn about it, you realise that the paper and the type all tell a story about the Atlantic and uh, where they came from and the things that the Americans at that time couldn't get hold of and had to import from Britain or were able to produce themselves and were very, very proud of. So it's sort of how those stories are embodied in the text. And they're things that wouldn't necessarily jump out at you unless the label told you about it. So it's the two things working together in a case. And it's something that makes perfect sense in an exhibition. That's what an exhibition does. It's added guides to a collection item and introducing it to people who wouldn't otherwise know about it. Feedback, again, yeah, is important. There's always feedback forms and occasional surveys and counts of how many people go in and out of the place. It's a while ago, can't remember the numbers, but they were good in the sense you realised, wow, 30,000 people or something in a room a couple of months or whatever it was. And that's a lot of readers, actually, of your labels and items. And feedback forms were along the lines of, gosh, I didn't know that about Franklin. So you realise, actually, yes, people are learning and begin to enjoying and understanding things a bit more and uh, understanding the breadth of the collections and in this case that it isn't just British materials but it's American materials and alongside that we also had a series of events and uh, one of the more fun things was the performance of his uh, glass harmonica music um, so he invented this sort of instrument where you like rubbing a finger on a glass making that ghostly switching sound so we had a performance on that in the conference centre and you're sort of on the edge of your seat because as the air conditioning dries out the glass harmonica can make a quite a terrifying sound as well as a, a beautiful sound. That does sound amazing and a bit spooky as well. Thank you, Matt. Now, 
Benjamin Franklin was born in the Boston area, and so was Jack Kerouac. I'm drawing this bizarre and very unlikely connection because in 2012 he curated an exhibition titled Jack Kerouac's Manuscript Scroll of On the Road. Now, Matt, could you tell us more about this 2012 exhibition, starting from, you know, the manuscript scroll after which it was titled? Yeah, I don't know if we've ever segued from Boston to Lowell, from Franklin to Kerouac, well, that's the nice uh, connection. That was a slightly unusual one. I guess it comes back to the role of the librarian or curator as being embedded in wide research networks and helping to put people in contact with one another. It arose out of the British Association for American Studies, had a, a library and resources committee, which I took part in, and its um, chair was a Kerouac scholar, amongst other things. And he had got wind that the scroll, which is now in private hands after being sold at you know, Christie's the decade before, you know, a, a rich American donated it, had also lent it to a university um, who had the expertise in terms of paper conservation and so on. And they were happy to put it out on tour. There was also a film coming out around about that time. So there was a bit in the air. And it was a chance to put this very long scroll, for those who aren't entirely familiar with it, and there's a big debate about what it's actually typed on. It seems to be a sort of a roll of typing paper, three of them stuck together, and all the legends of Kerouac being fueled by coffee or amphetamines, though the latest scholarly research suggests it was more coffee than and maybe a drink than anything else. Uh, and so he typed it all up in three weeks. Um, again, that's probably not entirely true, and it was, it was a longer process than that. But there's this sort of symbolic, as an object, it's a fascinating thing. It was great. It seemed the perfect place to display it right in front of the King's Tower in the front lobby of the British Library. A chance for people to see this, a chance to be reminded of the America's collection. So alongside that, I was able to work with the head of America's at the time, who's, who's you know, again, very interested in the beats. And she selected a wonderful collection of fine press and other beat materials from paperbacks of On the Road through to Bill Burroughs materials and later materials as well that people were inspired by the beats. So, yeah, so we were able to arrange special delivery, some film screenings around it, the insurance, which we had to arrange, and the brilliant exhibition team at the BL had fun creating this 13-metre-long case for it with bulletproof glass on top. And then the keeper of the scroll came over from America and very gingerly rolled it out, if you can imagine trying to roll it out um, without it going in the wrong, wrong direction. And then we added a certain amount of interpretation alongside this case, pointing out one or two of the more salient points, how it was written, who some of the people might have been, the meanings of it, and so on. Now, oh, that's incredible. Thank you. Now, Matt, with the next question, I would like to picture you at work another time. So while curating the Benjamin Franklin exhibition, you were, so to speak, spoiled for choice. Whereas with Kerouac, you were basically putting together a whole exhibition about one single item. So my question for you is, I suppose, how did you get around that problem, provided that, you know, you perceive this objective limitation as a problem at all? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And you can see, particularly art galleries, I think, have different approaches to these questions and explore different methods of presenting an item. And you see at the National Gallery showing one particular painting in great detail, perhaps rather than a whole series of items about an artist's work or a movement's work. And the visitor gets a very different experience, I suppose, of the item. In this case, yeah, it was really a chance to have what is obviously as an object, people just want to see it. And in fact, it's large and long and slightly curious. It would have its own star attraction. And that's where an exhibition ideally works hand in glove with an exhibition designer. And again, that's what happened in this case. And the sense was we would keep this very, very clean and uh, minimal, as it were. So there wasn't a vast amount of imagery around the place. There were some blown up photographs of some of those sort of stereotypical things about the beats, some pictures of them play or on the road. And indeed, it was great at the opening event to get one of them back. I think now it was Dave Abrams to come and stand in front of a picture of him. He was 80 or something like that, having photographs taken. And there he was, a 20-year-old, and it was a nice juxtaposition. But yeah, we just knew that the manuscript would be the centrepiece. So it was literally the centrepiece roll, rolled right in front of the British Library's in George IV's tower. And there was room just under the stairwell, essentially, for a, a case. And that case had these collection materials that I mentioned to do with the pulp editions of On the Road and the later fine press responses and so on, and some interpretive text at the beginning and end. So it made sense to not, not try and cram in as many things as possible, which might be something you would do in another exhibition, maybe in a bigger space or for another topic. You know, as you were talking about the manuscript scroll, I got instantly reminded of the massive Bayeux tapestry, a 70-metre monument to the Norman conquest of England put together in the 11th century. The manuscript scroll, true, does not have any images, it is just, so to speak, a wall of text, but the spirit is, I think, quite appropriately the same. Alright, Matt, 
I feel that we could go on for hours talking about all of the other exhibitions that you have curated, and there are many, but let us talk about the present instead. Are you going to be involved in any other exhibitions at Queen's or elsewhere in the near future? Yeah, in the near future is a moot point at the moment. One of the sad things about the pandemic, of course, is it's tricky to think about exhibitions, although those places that have been able to open, it's been really interesting to see what it's like going to a museum or a gallery where numbers are necessarily restricted. So it's been like a nice private view and um, people who go really enjoy and spend the time looking at things and have the space to look at them. But it's very tricky to expand and get people in. And in the near future, in terms of what is needs to be focused on, exhibitions and displays are probably lower down the priorities than getting people safely in and out of the reading room. So that gets the priority. So we've been looking online instead. We've been doing online exhibitions and displays. We've done one on contagion on the page. It's been called looking at pandemics and plague and uh, other times of disease. And in the past, the Oxford and Queen's twist trying to see take a slightly different view so sort of the legal context how the laws in the reign of Elizabeth I responded to plague but also spoke to social worries at the time as well how people like Edmund Halley used death rates for the first time to calculate mortalities and so on as well as reports of treatments for disease in the past and it's a fairly I suppose obvious exhibition to do but it was good to have something for the team to work on and just to highlight what's there in the collections. In the future, yes, there will be exhibitions. And I suppose the first thing is trying to think carefully about how those are programmed. It's nice to be able to do ad hoc ones and do things that respond to events. But it's also good to think, how does this work underpin the work and uh, aims of the college? How does it underpin research that's taking place? What groups would be good to work with? Before I started, they were the first undergraduate-led exhibitions where people selected materials themselves. So we'll hopefully do more of that. But the first things we will revisit are the Queen's Poetry and Translation art archive, looking at probably doing something online, first of all, but looking at that publication of that work and the archive, which is most, or some of which is held here in Queen's and uh, many Queen's members are involved in. So that'll be the first thing that we'll be doing. Well, that sounds like a really hopeful prospect. And we're all eagerly looking forward to all the exhibitions that you're going to organise for and with Queen's in the coming years. All right, Matt. Now, one last more general question before we move on to the last section of our interview. You are not from London and you did not study there. You are from the southwest, as you said earlier, in the study of New York, in the north of England. But you did work in London for about 20 years and you still live there, as a matter of fact. So here's my question for you. Could you tell us about your own personal experience of London? Is it a good city for a librarian to live in? And uh, is it a good city for, you know, libraries and book lovers in general? Yeah, I mean, I guess London, very much like Oxford, you know, has an extraordinary collection of libraries, large and small, support to some extent by access to the, the British Library. There's also I think places like the London Library, you know, response to the British Library in the 19th century, and a place very much for, for writers as well. And then within Bloomsbury in particular, there's this great density of libraries um, around the University of London, the institutes there, along with other institutions too, and church libraries. So there really is an extraordinary density of materials. And underpinning that are, are talks and lectures and so on that the Bibliographical Society organises and other groups organised. Plus you have the bookshops, you have the sales, the auction houses. Many of the people who work there of course, are deeply knowledgeable and fascinated but in manuscripts and books and so on. And uh, so yes, if you enjoy London, if you can cope with the downsides, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, of course, the drawback of being a librarian is it's really the most um, well remunerated of professions and London isn't the cheapest of cities to live in. It's dreadfully expensive, right? At both London and Amsterdam, I would say, are probably the most expensive cities in Europe. All right. Yeah, I never lived in London myself, but I've been there many times. So what you were talking about sounded very familiar and I couldn't agree more. All right, Matt. So we made it to the third section of our interview and we'll go back to that after a short break. All right, Matt, let's do this. We've made it to the third and final section of our interview and we're turning once again to the College Library at Queen's just from a historical perspective this time. So here's my first question for you. When was the heart of the Manuscript and Rare Books collection put together? Was it a one-off massive process, like, you know, a donation or a cumulative series of small acquisitions over decades and centuries? 
Yeah, I guess the history of the library is an interesting one. Perhaps unlike other, some other college libraries, it's less an accretion of volumes over time. There's several big bangs which created the library. So taking the manuscripts, first of all, of which perhaps there are you know, several hundreds of medieval, fruit and modern, and plus the archives of the college as well, of which we're fortunate to have an archivist some of the time who looks after that as well. But the manuscripts, the medieval portion did not survive in place. But what we do have are things that were acquired by fellows and others, largely for the 18th and 19th century, and with some 20th century traditions as well, gifts from people like Thomas Hardy in terms of some you know, modern manuscript material, modern poetry material, and then only that sort of medieval illuminated manuscripts which were acquired along with fragments and so on. So in and of themselves, they are wonderful treasures, and they also speak of the interests of largely 19th century fellows and manuscript collectors and what they thought were worthy of collecting. The printed book collection, again, it grew over time to some extent. And uh, like other colleges, undergraduates and others were expected to give their materials, give a gift of books, which grew over time. But there were one or two big donations. Barlow, Williamson in the 17th century gave very important sort of uh, collections from those periods which formed the heart of it. And many people argue that's why the fine Baroque Library was built to house these collections. And, and these are particularly strong in theology, classics, travel, the materials you might expect of a humanist and theological library in the early modern period. But then there is this great gift in the 19th century of about £30,000, which was a vast sum in those days, which had to be spent within seven years. Um, so the librarian consulted with colleagues at the Bodleian and was able to essentially buy broadly and quite deeply as well. And so rather than acquiring, I suppose, a college library, it was more a ideal bibliographical library. So it is an extraordinary thing. Before these things were unaffordable, I suppose, although bibliomania meant that there was a market for, for Shakespeare or whatever, but they, they were able to buy representatives of you know, the Western canon in very good quality editions for the most part. And it created perhaps the best arguably collection in a college library at that time and perhaps to this day. So the early printed and rare books collections run to about 120,000 volumes. So it is quite substantial. A light of that is the interesting things that just grew up over time in the teaching collection, I suppose you might call it. And over the years, they've become more interesting in some ways into their rarity or their provenance or connection with those who've used it. And then smaller interesting collections have been added to it over time as well. Gifts of materials to do with Cumbria, where the college has a, a long-standing history of the Bridgewater Bequest, of perhaps one of the finest collections of Cumbriana that, that exists. A very fine collection of First World War pamphlet material, important European and poetry materials of the 20th century. And then the Peat collection as well, the Peat Library of Egyptology is you know, an important working library but also has very rare volumes as well. So yeah, it's one of those things you could go on, but I think the story is more of really key and speedy bequests. So suddenly nothing happened very much for a very long time, and then it happened very quickly on a number of occasions. And then the other side of that, of course, and like other libraries, books come in, but books go out. And over the time, things wandered off for various reasons, or were donated or given to the Bodleys and the Barlow materials, where some of the materials went off there. And in the 1930s, the, the library needed some work doing. It was very lacking in space, and so there was debate about what to do. Some of the materials were disposed at that point as well. And it's interesting to follow through the process of people work out what should be sold and at what point it should be disposed of. But yeah, to end on a happy note, that it's quite a cohesive collection as well as being um, developed at various points over the last 400 years. Wow, thank you. Thank you for such a complete history of the College Library over just a few minutes. All right, Matt, along the same lines, is there anything that distinguishes the College Library at Queen's from, you know, the many other college libraries in Oxford? Anything that makes it unique somehow? I think probably the upper library, but clearly a Baroque reading room like that, all of the carving from the bookcases with a library within it, which has been built for, not you know, it's been changed over time, but there's good representative amongst it. That makes it unique. And I think the other side of it as well is that it's still a working library. There's the new library built under the Provost Garden just a few years ago, very modern and minimalist, but that is connected. You can walk straight from there up to the upper library. And so it's there literally in the middle of college at the heart of a run College right next to the Hall and SCR. Other college libraries that you know, are like this as well, very much part of college life. But I think it's the intensity of it that perhaps differs from the others. That was crystal clear. Thank you, Matt. All right, now let's talk about buildings. The College Library at Queen's is among the most beautiful libraries in Oxford. So, Matt, could you tell us more about the building and how it has changed over the centuries from the foundation down to the present day? 
Yeah, any building, I suppose, changed and develops over the years. And I sort of like the story of when the New Bridge Library was built. It was designed to be last for 250 years. And the idea was that it would not stay the same for 250 years. That walls could be moved and so on, adapting to how people use libraries. And over its long gestation, functions like the proposed period search room and um, card catalog was realised that's going to be replaced by a computer. So that turned into a space for the King's Tower. At least that's one story about that space in the library. But of course, yeah, the upper library has suffered from lack of space, and more positively, thanks to the growth of the collection, materials like the Pete Library had to be squeezed in. So bookshelves had to be placed in between the larger book presses. A new library was built underneath that as well, allowing people to perambulate around them. And then the great shock, I suppose, to the librarian, perhaps, of letting junior members and undergraduates in, which happened in the 19th century and then increased into the 20th century, meant there needed to be no more space for more undergraduates to read and that has led to the development of the new library and I suppose there's been a recognition of how people use and study books has changed just using a sloping desk or a flat desk and people consulting reading taking notes is still an important part but increasingly there's spaces for people to group work to have sort of show and tell type activities working with special collections in climate controlled spaces are important as well so the libraries have to uh, respond to all of these things over time and I suppose the other part of the story is returning the upper library and indeed the lower library to its former glory and in the architectural intentions so taking out the extra book presses which have been placed in both of the reading room restoring the lighting and the spaces as well to give a bit of uh, room for readers to come in amazing i really like this idea of the library as a thing that changes over time as a living being almost right okay earlier we said that the manuscripts and rare books in the college library were acquired from a number of collections and owners so Matt, I wanted to ask you, is it always easy to retrace the provenance of individual items? And maybe, you know, to make this absolutely clear for our listeners, could you please mention an item that is particularly mysterious in terms of its provenance? Yeah, it's never straightforward. The catalogues really, it's not until the 19th century do you have a systematic catalogue, and even then things have had to be updated recently. So the early arrival of materials is not always well recorded, but they're not always detailed enough to tell what has come in. It's really the detective work and uh, several fellows, Queens and elsewhere, have done great work on that. People like William Paul on, on Barlow's collection here, explaining how it came to be and what bits did here and what bits were at the bodily and so on. But there are several clues within the books themselves, and this is where the physical object actually is important. The library was a chained library through the 18th century, largely with books, but not entirely, with their foredge out and their spines inward. And so you can sometimes see clues with the name of the book written on the foredge of the leaves and then marks where the chain used to be. There are clues in the shelf mark, though they've largely been replaced by modern ones. There should be a record of the older ones, and that might relate to Barlow's north and south side of his room where the books were, and there might be a clue. There are annotations, which give an idea to the owner. There are sort of known bequests, which, again, within those quests, there's where was the book before it was in Queen's Library. So, so there's the provenance, the pre-Queen's provenance as well. But there's all sorts of clues and hints. There's clues in the bindings, where they've been rebound and so on. But I suppose in terms of the mysteries, I mean, one thing I've been working on recently with colleagues is ghostly psalms. This is uh, Miles Coverdale's and the Protestant reformer at the time of Henry VIII. The first English hymnal and a translation of several of Luther's songs. The ghostly psalms, it's the only copy that survives. They were ordered to be burnt. And it's a rather mysterious text. We're not quite sure when it was printed, though there are clues in it 1535 or thereabouts. But what it's doing in Queens is a mystery. It's about 60 odd pages, something like that. But it's bound with other pamphlets in pamphlet book, which has been rebound, but is also as a contemporary manuscript list of the contents at the start. So it has been together for some time. And the provenance there of why this one copy survived and why it's in Queens and what collection it was in is a bit of a mystery. So it's a matter of the moment of going through the early shelf marks and seeing what other volumes are next to it. It's almost slightly curtailed by the pandemic, but that's one interesting bit of provenance research. So so it's important to do because it's an incredibly valuable and rare item. It's important for the history of England and Germany at the time. It's important because the more you know about what it was doing in Queens, it can tell you about the history of religion and theology in Queens at the time. And then also about the nature of the collection and uh, understanding the sort of books and pamphlets that are near it and uh, were collected by the same collector makes you understand maybe how it was uh, seen at the time as well and maybe why that one single copy survived when all the others were burned. And that was a very good one. Thank you, Matt. Now, I would agree that no books are better than others, but some of them are certainly more curious, 
So feel free to interpret curious as interesting, quirky, or, you know, even disturbing, depending on what's in your mind. But could you tell us about the most curious manuscript and the most curious rare book in the college library, according to you? Oh, yo, gosh, that's an interesting one. I mean, there's some fascinating individual, rather humble volumes, but they're, they're, you, know, you can tell they've been used and owned by people and they have a certain charm and interest to them. But there is one volume which is in the vault and it's got the devil's signature or handwriting in it. And it's a sort of a collection of texts and scripts and languages from the Middle East and elsewhere. And it is, I remember, I think 17th century. And so just by dint of it being slightly cultish, but that's not why it interests me. It's the fact that there is this one page which has a manuscript sort of example of what's supposed to be the devil's writing. What is fascinating is the way that everybody has gone straight to this page, the, the book falls over open on this page it's been repaired a few times and everybody's had a good old sort of touch it and so on and so the page is really sort of almost shiny with the mount like you see on statues on their toes and things where people have touched it that story you just see so many people having a look and the curiosity of it so yeah i think that that's the most curious items that we have and it's an example of curiosity affecting the text itself yeah, I quite like the idea of manuscripts as things and objects that people have handled over the centuries and i think you've made a splendid case for it thank you Okay, now let's change the subject for the last two questions. At the start of the interview, Matt, we talked about the present and past of librarians, but what about their future? What will the college library look like in 50 years, and will there be any substantial differences between the college library and major research libraries, such as, you know, the Bodleian Library or the British Library, which we discussed many a time earlier in the interview? Yeah, that's a really important question. And I suppose curators and librarians and archivists, they're always making this hunt on what they think the future is going to be. They're, and the, you, one is trying to predict what users, readers will want. And you can make certain educated guesses and go in that direction. The pandemic has shown that people will use and have a demand for electronic resources. But there's still a lot of evidence that people want both. They want electronic resources when it's convenient, but they also will want to print things as well. And there remains a lot of things that either aren't electronic or unaffordable. And copyright led legislation unless something dramatic changes and publishing trends unless something dramatic changes even with open access means a lot of things will only be available physically i think even in 50 years hence user behavior would be fascinating to see how things change and it really is in terms of just accessing catalogs people expecting catalogs work more like google rather than you know, limiting things by name and author and so on and using mobile phones first rather than laptops and so on the patterns of collaborative work and study how they change over time but on the other hand, the process of going to a place, the fact that people want to go to different places, different points in their research and study, just as a really important place for a library. It really gets your head in the right zone to study and focus or gives you a break in some ways if you're stuck on something. Um, so there will always be a demand for a place to study, to access materials, I think, which would be really important. Somewhat unquantifiable, but um, all the studies, and there have been several about the architecture of space and studies, which shows that they're really valued and important. And there are correlations between success at degree and study and so on with libraries which are really quite telling um, and then there's i suppose the collections what will be interested in 50 years time and it'd be it's really important clearly to be a record of college life of capturing experiences of the pandemic and the ephemera that relates to that but then there's also documenting the now and uh, providing building collections which speak to studies that maybe take place in 50 years time i'm sure people will be studying british history and life and uh, poetry and so making sure that those things are present and captured and we are recording gathering those things before they disappear or only only perhaps are kept in copyright libraries and can't be used in more interesting ways. But uh, libraries also spend a lot of time debating the future. And the I tend, I suppose, to look back and see how things have changed and adapted over time and, and maybe getting clues from that. Yeah, the one thing is protecting and preserving what you do have and understanding the importance of it, whilst also providing the flexibility and the opportunity for people to, to do new things with them that there's no way that we could think of but giving them that opportunity. Now, that's very clear and a very intriguing perspective as well. Thank you, Matt. All right, the very first question I asked you was about your research as a doctoral student. So let's end the interview with an open question about your own research now. So, Matt, have you been working on anything new recently? Anything you would like to tell us about before we say goodbye? Yeah, I've just completed a volume on the invention of newspapers, Reaction Press, and hopefully that should be out fairly soon in the next couple of months. 
And it tells the story of why and how newspapers came into being in the 1700s. And of course, the Oxford Gazette began the story of newspapers in the UK to some extent. And it's a story that's often been told a fair few times before. But what I wanted to do was to explore why people read newspapers and how people read newspapers and look at a series of sort of case studies, really from the English Civil Wars up to the American Civil Wars, looking at points where newspapers were particularly important or contested and some of the characters and uh, people that were involved in that process. And it's been particularly interesting writing up in the last few years as news, truth and the manipulation of both those things have clearly been um, dominating the way politics in Britain and America has been taking place. So that's coming out soon. And I suppose it was also follows on from earlier interest in how print and more ephemeral items interact with everyday life and things which get thrown away and turned into fish wrapping or used to be actually have a real importance beyond their couple of pence um, costs and their ephemeral nature. Fantastic. It sounds like an amazing book, you know, and I think we should all look into that as soon as it's out. Thank you, Matt. Okay, our interview has come to a close now, but it is perhaps the right moment to tell our listeners about our new project. So, Matt and I are working on a series of short videos about manuscripts and rare books in the college library, which is called Parchment and Paper. By the way, you will find a link to the relevant videos of Parchment and Paper in the description of this podcast. So, on Parchment and Paper, Matt and I will be speaking occasionally, but we are planning to invite many guest speakers from Queen's, from other colleges and from other universities as well, so please give it a try and you will not be disappointed. The first video is already out, with Jen Edwards, our wonderful CDF in English at Queen's, telling us about early editions of Shakespeare. There will be other coming up regularly, so yeah, watch this space. In the meantime, Matt, thank you very much for being a part of this series. I truly hope that our audience will enjoy listening to this as much as I've enjoyed interviewing you today. It's been wonderful, really. Thank you again. Oh, well, thank you. And uh, thank you for listening. Yeah, thanks for listening. Bye bye. Here we are, the acknowledgement section once again. First of all, chronology. This interview was recorded on the 12th of February 2021 and has been published, as you can see, at the start of July. Many things have changed in terms of COVID-19, but perhaps not the things that we thought would change and not as much as Matt and I hoped that would change in the interview. As I re-listened to this one last time from Italy, where I am at the moment, the feeling was awkward and uncomfortable, but some things did change nonetheless, vaccination rollout for one thing, and so we must be patient and we'll make it out of it sooner or later. A huge thanks to those listeners who actually got in touch with suggestions. Please keep it going, as this really keeps us going in so many ways. My email address is gabriele.rota at queens.ox.ac.uk. If you didn't get it, you can find it in the podcast description. The first episode of Parchment and Paper came out some days ago. It features Matt Show and Jan Edwards in conversation about Shakespeare. They covered so much ground in not even 20 minutes. Now that you listen to this, go on YouTube and watch Parchment and Paper as well. You will find it on our YouTube channel, CMTC Media. The second episode of Parchment and Paper will be recorded in August. A conversation with Richard Parkinson and Chris Hollings, fellows in Egyptology respectively in the History of Mathematics at Queen's. They will be telling us about the Pete Library, the astonishing collection of Egyptology at the Queen's College dedicated to the memory of T.E. Pete, a famous Egyptologist at Queen's in the first half of the 20th century. Pandemic permitting, this episode of the video cast will be recorded in person in the library and we are all very excited about the prospect. As usual, I'm taking a few seconds to thank the excellent musician Michele Tazin for composing the theme song. A link to Michele's Facebook page is available in the podcast description. Please support him if you feel like, which he certainly deserves. I, on the other hand, do not deserve all the help and support from friends and colleagues and from you, my listeners, as well. So if I keep doing this and enjoy it so much, this is all thanks to you. You are all, we are all amazing together. A great thanks to TDS, finally, for providing excellent audio equipment for home recording and for in-person recording too, soon, hopefully. Bye-bye.